Welcome to Brain and Advice. Uh, today we have Michael Humer from um, University of uh, Boulder, Colorado. Um, uh, Michael is in a, a state that some would re- would uh, describe as rather anarchic, um, but I think he'll object to that abuse of the term anarchy. Um, Michael has written one of the the great books on anarchy as a political system, and uh, we're going to be talking about that today, and not the sort of sense of uh, chaos and burning uh, that one uh, might find in places like Portland. Um, so. Mike, would you like to start with the thought experiment? Yeah, so, you know, I start my, my book, The Problem of Political Authority, with this hypothetical example. So, you know, suppose that I live in a neighborhood where, you know, we have this problem with vandals, and for whatever reason, nobody's doing anything about it. And so I decide that I'm going to fix the problem. So, like, I and my family get our guns, and we go around the neighborhood looking for um, vandals. And when we find one, we uh, kidnap him at gunpoint. And then we lock him in a little cage in my basement, right? And I have this, I have all these cages there. And don't worry, I feed them so they won't die or anything. But, um, and, you know, if you want, uh, you can imagine that I, I hold a little trial where they get to defend themselves, okay? <laughs> but, uh, you know, and then when I conclude that they are criminals and I lock them in that cage, right? And then after I've been doing this for a while, I go around the neighborhood and, um, you know, maybe you're one of my neighbors and I go to your door and, um, you know, hey, you know, you owe me money for my services, right? I've been protecting you from the criminals. And so now you owe me $200 for the last month, right? And, um, you know, you're a little bit skeptical about this, maybe not quite happy to pay me. And um, I note that if, unfortunately, if you decide not to pay, then I will have to label you as a criminal, at which point you will also be subject to long-term confinement in my basement. Uh, I indicate that I'm ready to take you by force and, you know, I'm carrying a gun at my hip. Okay, so, you know, you have uh, a couple of philosophical questions, right? Number one, um, am I behaving properly? Uh, is, it, is it appropriate for me to demand the money from you? And uh, number two, are you morally obligated to pay me? And, you know, when you think about this, most people think, no to both, right? Like number one, that I can't do this. Uh, I can't like, you know, just demand that people pay me for my services and then lock them up if, if they don't pay. And number two, you don't have any good reason to pay me. You should just tell me to fuck off and go away, right? But unfortunately, you know, I have my gun, so I'm gonna take you by force, okay? And, um, you know, in case this isn't obvious, um, this is an analogy for the government. In that story, I am a small government, right? I'm, you know, I'm like acting exactly like the government, okay? Most people think it's unacceptable. You know, why is it different when the big government does it, right? And just because I'm like, it's just me and my family, so we're a really small government. And, you know, as far as I can tell, the only difference with the U.S. government is that it's a lot bigger. So this is a, an argument for why the government or a state is not politically legitimate, right? Just like I'm not politically legitimate if I start imprisoning people in my basement and demanding uh, money from others for protecting them from those people. Um, it seems like the state is not uh, legitimate in demanding taxes. Okay. So um, the one question, the one set of questions we could ask is around, um, are we sure that's the case? This, is this a good analogy? Is the government really not uh, politically legitimate? But I'd like to put those aside because um, we have discussed some of those questions in previous episodes. But the questions that I really want to ask now are, okay, so if we don't have a government and we don't have a state, so we don't have someone locking people in their basement, if we don't have a collection of people locking, locking others in their basement and demanding protection money, what would we have? So what kind of society would we have? And one of the questions, the first question that, that comes to mind is, um, how, would, how would we secure our own personal safety? So uh, in, in this case that you've given, the way that the neighbors secure their safety is through you locking criminals in your basement. Um, if those criminals are not locked in your basement, um, how do those neighbors secure their safety? You know, the, the anarcho-capitalist uh, idea is not to not have any security, right? Um, it's not to kind of like abolish that whole function that the state is performing. Rather, the idea is to privatize it. 
right? So the anarcho-capitalists, myself included, want to have, um, want to outsource the police, right? In other, in other words, um, you can have private security guard companies. And, you know, like right now, there are more private security guards than there are government police in the country. And uh, right now there are occasionally times when even the government hires private security instead of using their own police, right? Um, so, and you could imagine, um, you could imagine just doing this in more and more places, right? What if the government says, we don't want to patrol this area anymore. We're going to hire a private security guard company, right? And what if they just do that um, in more and more places? Eventually they're doing it everywhere, right? So we live in South Africa um, and we, we find ourselves in a very similar situation where there are many more private security than there are police. Um, and that it tends to be the case that the wealthy um, supplement the police with private security. In other words, there isn't a confidence that the police will look after them. Uh, and so they hire these agencies. But here, here might be a difficulty for your position. So the way that a private security agency currently works is they will apprehend someone um, and then hand them over to the police for prosecution in the event that they were attacking your house or caught in the middle of a robbery. Now, if we have no central state uh, and we have no agreed upon set of rules as to what constitutes a crime, and we have no um, police force that private security can hand someone over to, how do we resolve this? So it might be that you've got a number of different agencies and people sign up to them because they provide what they deem good protection services in, in a marketplace, but they might have very different rules as to what counts as a crime. So for example, you can imagine someone saying, well, I want a private security um, agency that's going to lock up my noisy neighbors. So I'll pay extra if they're playing, you know, Black Sabbath at two o'clock in the morning. If you beat the living shit out of them, I'm going to pay extra for that because I really, really hate that. And on our rules, you know, in our sort of, uh, you know, in our company that we've signed up to, everybody agrees that internal members won't play Black Sabbath at two o'clock in the morning. We can do this to the externals. And other companies have their own particular sets of rules. Bon Jovi uh, and the other companies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that definitely deserves a big beating if you're playing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how do we deal with this issue? In other words, you have different sets of rules and you have no central authority that, you know, the alleged criminal can be handed over to. Yeah, I mean, there are sort of a few different cases. So uh, if you're living in a particular neighborhood, you might have a homeowners association for your neighborhood. Or, you know, if you're in like a, um, a building, like an apartment building, it might be an HOA for that building. Um, or you might just, if you're renting, um, there's just an owner of the building. And so they could determine what the rules are on their property, right? Like if you're renting, then the landlord determines what the rules are for that property. If you're, if you're in an HOA, the HOA determines what the rules are. Okay, uh, another case though, is you could have interactions between people who um, maybe live in different neighborhoods. And so they might be under different rules and then what? And they might also have different security companies. If they have the same security company, there's not a problem. But uh, what if they have different security companies and then what happens is they need to have their dispute arbitrated by a third party. Now, what would happen in our society is they go to court, right? Like, like, you know, you're complaining about your neighbor playing this music and you think he shouldn't be allowed to and he thinks he should be allowed to. And then um, in principle, you can go to court, although that's an extremely inefficient and, ex and expensive way to go, right? But if it gets bad enough, you do that. And in the anarcho-capitalist society, you would also go to the court. It's just that the courts would have been privatized. So there would be like, um, you know, private arbitrators, which there are right now. They don't call them courts because the government, the government courts get called courts, but there are um, private companies that resolve disputes, right? And, uh, you know, many people go to this, even in our society, even though there's like a government system because the private system is um, better, right? Right. So like, you know, if you um, uh, if you have a if you sign a contract with someone very frequently, there will be a clause in the contract that says if we have any disputes, we'll go to private arbitration or to an arbitration company. And the reason for that is, well, um, it gets it gets disputes resolved faster and a lot cheaper and um, probably more reliably also. Right. Reliably in the sense of sort of like being perceived as fair. Right. And so, like, that's what you do if you have a dispute with somebody um, who has a different protection agency. 
So I, I practice as a lawyer um, and I, I feel the pain that you feel about a, a court system, which is unwieldy, um, which is, uh, you know, hard to navigate, um, it is sort of expensive to operate in. And so it's a common discussion among colleagues that we should have arbitration centers. And um, there are a few that operate, but I will say this. There's, you, you mentioned the idea of people agreeing to be bound. So let me give you a, a case where we can sort of see how an arbitration would work very well. Let's say we're both employees of the same company and we have a Christmas party. And at the Christmas party, uh, I give you a hug and then my hand slowly kind of goes down your back and I pinch your bum. And you say, whoa, like that's, a, that's a breach of our sexual harassment policy. And we as employees have signed up to a particular code. Um, and you say, well, I want to go to HR. And HR now says you both agreed in advance to be bound by the rules of you know this this body, and we're going to you know have sanctions. You're going to you know you have to go on forced leave for two weeks, or we're going to fine you and dock your pay, or you know you guys have to go through some sort of uh, kiss and make up session. Um, so that, that all makes sense. Wouldn't right? like that, wouldn't you? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The bum <laughs> squeezer wants the kiss and make up session. <laughs> um, so, but here's the problem. Let's say I I go to your partner's christmas function at some other company and i pinch their bottom in the same way and they say well we must go to arbitration you know we must go see my hr department i say hold on a second i'm not an employee of your company i didn't sign any contract you know i'm not i'm not arbitrating to anything and that is the situation we generally find ourselves in that the people we want to arbitrate with are not the people we have agreements with so when we say it to the other person, but it's going to be so much cheaper and more efficient and we can pick a judge who knows the rules of our particular area and we can get a specialist. And this is exactly the kinds of things we say as lawyers to the other side all the time. It would be best for both of us if we agree. They say, but I don't want to agree because I don't want to pay you. I don't want to be held. I don't want to be sanctioned. Take me to court because it's cumbersome and difficult and all that stuff. So the difficulty is if we have not agreed in advance to be bound by an arbitration contract, how are you going to bind me after the fact, after the sort of wrong has already occurred. Yeah, you showed up, you know, like on somebody else's property, right? At somebody else's um, party. Um, well, you know, then like I, I call my security agency and they go to you and they say, hey, you know, you harassed Mike. <laughs> now, now you have to pay us. And then what do you do? Then you call your security agency and they go, oh, you know, our client says he didn't do this or whatever, <laughs> okay? And then my security agency negotiates with your agency. And, um, you know, how do they resolve it? Right. Well, uh, like the most efficient way for them to resolve it is they go to an arbitrator. Okay. And then, and you go, hey, you, you, could, you could say to your agency, hey, no, don't go to arbitration. Just refuse. Right. And then they go, fuck you. We're not going to war for you. Why would we do that? Okay. <laughs> All right. And in fact, they probably have a contract with you, which probably says that you agree to resolve any disputes by arbitration, because otherwise they wouldn't want you as a client, right? If you won't agree to that. That seems like the juncture when I sever my contract with the security agency. I say, hold on a second. You're right. Maybe I did sign such an arbitration agreement that I'd be bound. And you no longer represent me. I'm out. Now okay. what? Your, your company says, yeah. but we agreed with your company and now we're going to take arbitration. I go, no, no, no. They don't represent me anymore. Uh, you have no yeah. authority to take this yeah. external arbitrator. You are now acting like some illegitimate body imposing your will upon me. No, uh, so I don't agree. You, so you have no security agency anymore. So then my agency comes and just like takes your money. Uh, right? and then, or whatever, you know, whatever they think is the appropriate punishment. Okay. And then you go, well, oh, it's unfair. I didn't agree to this. Right. But I mean, the, the libertarian philosophy is not everybody has to agree to everything. That's not the philosophy. That's nobody's view. Right. Um, you know, if you committed a rights violation against somebody, then, you know, like you have to pay compensation. Like you don't, you don't have the right to not agree. Right. You cannot agree to something like you cannot agree to work for me, but you can't not agree to pay compensation if you committed a tort. Right. Uh, th this, this I find fascinating to my mind, that you're going to bring up words like rights and torts without a central state authority. So if you want to say, okay, well, hold on, there's some moral system sitting behind all of this, and we all agree that there's a right and a wrong. I mean, we don't agree on, on the contents of our rights in different legal systems. You know? So you want to say that we all would subscribe to some sort of inherent set of rules in the background 
Well, I want to know how you get to those rules without some sort of state system which is imposing the rules either through that. No, I mean, system. Look, if you don't agree, uh, um, like if you don't agree that people have rights, I don't care, right? Like it's it's not. I don't think it's um, the libertarian view, and it's certainly not my view that um, I only have rights if you agree that I do. Wrong, right? <laughs> Uh, if you so you know I, if you if I run into a psychopath who thinks nobody but himself has rights and like he can kill anybody, um, well no right and then you know then we just hire security guards to take that guy prisoner or whatever we think is appropriate like exile them or whatever, and they go no I don't agree that you have rights so I don't agree that murder is wrong and then we go well we don't care. So a, a very important part of your setup is that people generally need some sort of security agency to protect them from others. Um, and, and things will often boil down, conflicts will often boil down to some sort of arbitration uh, where the two parties are our respective security companies. Um, and, and, and Mark is trying to push cases where, you know, that won't happen. For example, I give up my, my security company and, and now what happens to me? So I want to put those cases aside for a moment um, and look at a related case, which is what if I can't afford a security company? So let's say the poor. Um, a lot of people think that the function of a state, the reason why we should pay taxes is so that the state can uplift the poor <laughs> in a way that couldn't happen um, in a purely anarchic system. You could ask, what about the poor about any product or service? And like, you know, so like, I'm not sure that the security um, service is different from others. Um, will poor people get lower quality uh, protection? Yes, they will, right? Like they get lower quality everything. So like they have lower quality food and lower quality housing and lower quality clothing. And also they're gonna get lower quality protection. Um, that's going to be true in the anarchist society. That's also true in our society and in every other society, I think. Uh, and actually, well, that's the point of money. <laughs> like the reason why people want money, that's it, because they want the higher quality stuff. Okay. Now, um, okay, yeah, but what if they can't afford any at all? And like, you know, you could say, what if you can't afford any food at all? Then you're going to starve. Um, yeah, but that's extremely rare in a capitalist society, right? Like, I mean, the places where people are literally starving are like third world countries, right? And usually what's going on is that they have a corrupt dictatorial government, right? Which is just like, you know, stealing, you know, stealing money from the people all the time and not bothering to protect them and whatever. Um, in our society, like there's hardly anyone who can't afford food. And then, and, you know, like, some amount, some amount of protection is not pro probably not going to be that expensive, right? High quality protection, you know, can get more and more expensive. Okay, but anyway, like, yeah, what if they can't afford to to um, pay for protection services? Well, then they'll probably be in the situation of the poor right now, right? Because they're probably not they're not getting much protection from the government anyway, right? So let me give you an interesting case. Let's assume that uh, I'm this very wealthy guy uh, who can afford the, the creme de la creme of the protection services. And I've got a bunch of buddies who can do the same. And we've sort of set up ourselves as this uh, uh, oligopoly of uh, roving warlords. And we have a particular penchant for uh, kidnapping. And uh, it wouldn't be rape because on our system, we don't have a set of rules that would call it rape. But we, we go and we take people from the poor village and, um, you know, we take them to our houses, uh, we have sex with them against their will, um, and then we torture them to death. And they can't afford um, protection agencies. Um, our rules perfectly allow it because these people are untermentioned on our set of rules. Um, so, and, and what, do you, what are they going to do about it? Well, nothing. They're poor. Um, now, I might be doing something immoral, but um, it doesn't seem like you could do anything about it under your system. In the current system, you can. In other words, um, there are rich people who get away with exploiting the poor. But if you go and commit uh, a crime recognized by the state like murder mm -hmm. or rape or torture, um, you know, being rich only gets you so far. You, you're probably going to wind up getting incarcerated and removed from society. Without any central authority, I don't see how that works. Yeah, so, I mean, like, one thing you can do is just come up with purely hypothetical scenarios of, like, things that are logically possible to happen that would be bad. Um, but, you know, 
there are equally possible scenarios like what if the government decides to like kidnap a bunch of people and rape and murder them? And actually my example there is real. That really happens. Like there are many governments that have actually done that sort of thing. Um, but then, but like your story, although it's a theoretical possibility, exactly how many super rich people do you know who are like that? I don't think I'm but giving a There are serial murderers out there, but they're, they are not like rich people. I think I'm like, giving you know, a historical okay, case. Like. So I think we used to have feudal overlords um, where, for example, one of the, the rights as the feudal overlord was that you had um, the right to sleep with a maiden before she got married. Um, you, yeah, said, yeah. You, you live on my property and these are the rules that we have. And you know, you're yeah, that, poor and, and weak and that's what I'm going to do. And people did it. Um, yeah, I think, sounds, I think sounds like have, the government system. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to accept, I mean, I'm a state minimalist. I'm not a big fan of the government. I'm going to accept that the government has done all sorts of horrible things in its name, that it's killed, tortured, raped without a doubt. Um, I think there are going to be lots of I'm saying there. the example you just gave is an example of government exploiting people. Like the feudal overlord is the government, right? Sure. And it seems like, in other words, in the, when, we have a, when we have a state, we can hold that feudal overlord accountable to a set of rules. Um, if we have no state, in other words... There is no ultimate authority besides, as you say, some sort of moral authority that can hold people accountable. In the even in a in a state case, I mean, if you have a state that is that is rogue, that does you know horrible things either to its own citizens or to neighboring citizens, there's a global community. You know, those states can be held accountable. Those leaders can be you know put forward in tribunals wow. for genocide. Um, I mean, how, how do you hold happens. them accountable? That, oh, okay. Well, you have to wait, you have to hope for other governments to invade, and then what happens? Um, hundreds of thousands of innocent people get killed because, like, that's what war is, right? This isn't a great solution. Okay, but I mean, um, it's like you know you're sort of struggling against a thing that's just like a fact of nature, right? Like, um, assume that some person has total power and nobody can touch them. What's going to stop them from um, abusing other people, uh, you know, either their own conscience or nothing. Okay. But like, if, you know, if you just start with that assumption, okay. And then you're like, oh, so that's why we need to set up an organization that has total power. Right. But there's, there should just be one that has power over everyone else. Uh, no, <laughs> then there's nobody to stop them. And you're like, oh, but then maybe the United States will come and invade that country. And then, well, who's to stop the United States from abusing people, right? And then when the United States is trying to fix the problem, you know, they, they kill hundreds of thousands of people. And then after we're done doing that, and like we killed the guy who was raping and murdering, then, you know, 10 years later we leave and then somebody else comes who's doing the same thing, right? Because that's, that's the way it works, okay? But, you know, I mean, like that seems to me the story about the government system and, the capitalist system seems to be not like that in reality, right? Like you could imagine a story of like this evil genius businessman, like what if Bill Gates was evil and then we get rid of the government and then Bill Gates can like, you know, start raping and pillaging. Okay, yeah, but you know, he's not going to do that because like, that's not how business people normally are. They're not like serial murderers, right? Serial murderers are, are not great at business, right? And just like insane psychopaths and things like that. Okay, but anyway, but like, you know, going back, um, you know, you might kind of wonder, yeah, what's, what's really the important difference between private security agencies and the government? Like there's always the situation of um, you want somebody to provide security. So the person who's providing security has to have like the, the power to force people to do things. So just like that's inherently in, in the nature of the system, then that means that they could use that power to abuse people. Why won't they do that? Okay, and, and like, what's the difference between a security agency and a government police force, okay? Um, and basically the, the difference is in the government police situation, you eliminate competition. It's monopolistic. And the private security solution is competitive. That's the difference. 
So like in the anarcho-capitalist system, there are these security agencies, which are just like government police forces, except they're in competition with each other, which means like, if you don't like yours, you could hire a different one. And that's what causes people to behave better, right? Like that, so in other industries, that's why, um, you know, they lower prices, they try to improve the quality of their product, they try to keep their customers happy. The reason businesses do that is because they have competitors. And then, and the whole, I, whole central idea of government is we should have this, this industry, the protection industry, it should be monopolized, right? Unlike the other things, it should be monopolized so that the person who's providing security doesn't have to worry about any competitors. And then whatever they, whatever they do, like you just kind of don't have any recourse, right? So it sounds like um, when Mark raises these objections, uh, you'll notice I haven't really raised objections and that's because I agree. So, <laughs> so you're the first guest we've had that I actually agree with. Um, the way that you're dealing with the objections is in two ways. So the one, the one way to deal with the objections is by saying, okay, in practice, um, anarchism doesn't really involve these hypothetical problems that, that Mark is discussing. Um, and then the second, the second way to, to handle the objection is by saying, well, these problems are also problems for a state system, for a system that has a government or a state, they're gonna face these problems as well. Um, I, I'm, curious, um, I'm curious about a certain, uh, a certain type of problem that may be uh, doesn't permit to an easy explanation like that. Um, and that's kind of at the, at the heart of anarcho-capitalism, which is the capitalism bit, not just the anarchism bit. Um, specifically, we have these rules in place at the moment in the market um, to prevent um, total monopolization by one company. And they don't, they, they don't benefit society. The problem is if you don't regulate the market, some economists will argue that you will generate monopolies. So um, how would that be prevented in an anarcho-capitalist system? I think it's mostly not economists, but sort of like just random people who think that um, you get monopolies if you don't have the government to stop it, right? Um, it's very difficult to get a monopoly. So it's very difficult to get a monopoly merely by like being really good at competing in the marketplace. The easiest way to get a monopoly is to lobby the government to give you a monopoly. Right. And like, that's the, that's where monopolies usually come from um, because like the government already is a monopoly. And then, you know, in order, um, in order to influence the government's rules, you just need political influence. You don't have to be like super good at producing products in the marketplace, which is really hard, like producing a product that's so much better than other people's products that just like everybody goes to your company. That's extremely hard. But a lot easier is like making political connections with some people who have power in the government if there's a government. And you know, so like to explain why, um, why it's difficult to monopolize in the free market system, um, most industries have a most efficient, well, all industries have some most efficient size for a firm. And for most of them, that size is not big enough to supply the entire market. Right. And if you get, if your company gets bigger than the most efficient size, then it just becomes, uh, by definition, becomes less efficient. Right. So, like large organizations just get these kind of like bureaucratic complications and it gets um, more expensive per unit for them to provide goods. And then, you know, they have to raise their prices or something like that. And so, like, they just are forced to stop growing at some point. Um, now, this, what is the size um, that's most efficient? That depends upon the industry. And it depends upon kind of um, um, how big the fixed costs are, like how much you have to spend in order to just enter the industry. Uh, so like uh, example, in the automobile industry, the, the most efficient size is really big because um, the most efficient way to make a car is to have a factory, which is capable of producing like tens of thousands of cars every year, right? And okay, but there are other industries where you have you don't have like a really expensive factory with robots and whatever, uh, like say the security industry, like the fixed costs for that are minimal. So in the security industry, the most efficient size is probably pretty small. And that means it's going to be a very large number of security companies. And that means it's gonna be super hard to monopolize it, right? 
Like you have to be like this amazing genius you know, it's like somehow your company is like better than all the others, even, even as it gets much bigger and less efficient. Um, it's hard to see how that would happen, right? A big part of the argument here is, is that you're assuming that uh, companies um, and individuals will act in their self-interest. So it's not within the self-interest of the company to overgrow, its, uh, overgrow a certain point um, above which it may become a monopoly, but it wouldn't be as efficient. So it wouldn't be in its self-interest to do so. It wouldn't be as profitable. Um, so two things that come out in your book, um, which is quite interesting, which are quite interesting. The one is that um, states are not necessarily rational. Um, they're not necessarily trying to be profitable. What they're trying to do um, is act often according to a certain ideology, um, whereas companies wouldn't necessarily do that and people wouldn't do that, individuals. Um, so that seems like an advantage um, in an anarchic system. But uh, one might say that often people don't seem to act in their self-interest. Um, so Mark will probably say more about this, but he, he, he tells me about clients um, anonymously so that he doesn't breach any uh, confidentiality that uh, don't act in their self-interest. They are purely, uh, they're vengeful. They just want to hurt their opponent. Um, yeah. uh, it, they're not acting in a profitable way. It wouldn't, pro it, they would be better off not necessarily pursuing that uh, conflict, um, but they do so anyway. Um, yeah. we, can, we can imagine companies doing that or security agencies doing that. You find individuals um, acting, um, you know, irrationally or sort of like not profitably a fair amount, but it's pretty hard to find companies that do that. Anyway, there's a mechanism in the free market whereby um, that sort of like limits that, right? The mechanism is the companies that act um, on the profit motive grow. And they're all like all these companies are in competition with each other and the ones that are trying to be profitable get to grow and the ones that are acting irrationally or um, vengefully or whatever are going to shrink um, and they're going to have a hard time competing with the profit maximizing companies right now I mean this can be either good or bad most people um, and you know critics of capitalism see the bad side that you, you can have companies that are um, pursuing profit even when it's immoral. But most people don't see the other side, which is, you know, you can have um, sometimes uh, morality um, corresponds with what produces profits. And sometimes you have immoral things that are not profitable. And the good side of capitalism is it doesn't generally does not do the immoral things that are not profitable, right? Um, which there are actually a lot of, which the government does frequently, right? And like, you know, my, my favorite obvious example is, you know, the United States goes to war in Iraq in 2003, and we spend something like $3 trillion. And then, and we kill about 300,000 um, Iraqi citizens, most of them civilians. And we lose whatever it was, a few thousand American soldiers as well. All of that, that doesn't happen under capitalism. No company is gonna do that, right? Like no one's gonna spend a trillion dollars to kill people and get nothing for it. So I'm gonna give a historic case. Um, so if we sort of rewind back to a time um, before big states, so South Africa is founded um, by a company, the Dust East India Company. So the idea was they wanted a waypoint so they could go and buy uh, spices in the East. And so they set up a colony in South Africa. All right. And this is a company that is motivated by profit um, and becomes a colonizer. So in other words, takes over the land from those that live there, um, sets up stations. Um, it's not killing and invading um, for fun, um, but it's doing so to protect its own interests um, and to sort of set up this envoy. So you, you may find, I, I think you're right to say that, you know, capitalism is one of the, the greatest things that humanity has, has ever uh, come up with. You know, that the, in, the invisible hand of our, of our private interests can yield incredible goods, um, that we are kept in check in some way by our, by our interests. In other words, there are certain things that are irrational to do because they don't assist you. Um, and, you know, capitalism produces all these incredible results, all these wonderful inventions. Um, but it does seem that, you know, it, it, it may very well dovetail with 
infringing on the interests of others in quite severe ways. Uh, and that the early history of humanity often is these companies going to places uh, to make money, to make profits, to the detriment of the local inhabitants. Uh, the other issue that's interesting to my mind is the sort of claim that governments are well placed for solving very grand problems. So we think about the idea of a space race, you know, the, the claim would have been in the 60s, well, this couldn't have ever been done by any private body. This could only be done by two states competing with each other, Russia and America, and you achieve this incredible thing for humanity getting off the planet. Uh, you might think that a more current example might be something like uh, coming up with a vaccine for, for COVID. So, you know, ultimately something done by private pharmaceutical companies, but partly on the basis that they know they can contract with states. Um, that if they if they fail, um, you know, there will be some tax money that sort of helps bail them out so their companies don't go bankrupt, that there's something, some big global coordinating effort which makes it worth their private while to spend all this money and time trying to come up with something that won't bankrupt them if they fail. Can we achieve these, these great things under an anarchist system? I mean, there are some different alleged great things there, some of which are greater than others. So... You know, like sending a man to the moon. Well, it was a colossal waste of money. I mean, like a private company wouldn't have done that because it was a huge waste of money. Because like, what the hell do you get from that? Like, oh, we put a flag on the moon. Now we can bring back some moon rocks and like we can sell them as novelty items. Like, what, what is the huge benefit? I don't understand. Okay, now, you know, in a capitalist society, that might eventually happen when we become so fabulously wealthy that like, you know, you have rich people who want to go to the moon for vacation or something like that. Maybe that would happen, but it wouldn't have happened in like 1969 um, because it was totally inefficient. Okay. And you might think, yeah, but it was just cool that people went to the moon. Okay, whatever. <laughs> like things that are just cool. Some of those would not happen because there wouldn't be enough people willing to pay for them. Right. But I mean, I want to suggest you could be overvaluing that, right? Like maybe the fact that people are not willing to voluntarily pay enough to make the space program happen means that it's not worth it, right? Like the coolness is worth something. And I don't know how much the space program cost, okay? But whatever it was, you know, maybe the coolness isn't worth that amount, right? <laughs> um, now about the vaccine, yeah, that's actually a tangible benefit. That's, not, that's a lot better. You know, like getting a vaccine for a deadly disease is a lot better than landing someone on the moon or whatever. Yeah, but I mean, you can sell the vaccine, right? And then you're worried about, yeah, but like the company, when, when they're doing the research, they don't know if it's going to work out. And like they could spend a bunch of money doing research and it could fail. Okay, but wait, this is also explaining like, and then maybe the government will bail them out. Okay, but this is also explaining the problem with the government. So that creates a moral hazard problem, right? Like if they're really expecting the government to bail them out, if they fail, that means that they don't have enough incentive to not fail, right? That is, that means that they can waste a ton of money on stuff that doesn't work out. And like, and we don't want people doing that, right? Okay, so like, what should they be doing? Well, they should be doing kind of an expected utility calculation. And like, so if you're a utilitarian, this is what you want. But also, this is like, you know, what you want as a businessman. You want them to say something like, okay, you know, what's the probability that this line of research will, will succeed? And if it succeeds, what's the value of the thing that it's going to produce? Like, you know, how much can we sell it for? And then what's the cost of this whole line of research? You want them to weigh those against each other and only do the line of research if the expected value is greater than the expected cost. Okay, and like, um, you know, the benefit of having the government there to possibly bail out companies. I don't know if they've bailed out pharmaceutical companies. They, I don't know. They bail out a lot of people, so they probably have, right? But like if they're doing that, then they're just enabling you to go ahead with something even when the expected value is less than the expected cost, right? There's, a, there's two problems uh, raised by your response. So the one, the one problem is that it hints towards an issue of value. Um, if the only reason why we pay for something is to obtain something profitable, um, then that might that might not encompass uh, all values that we might want to fund. So, for example, we might want to fund the arts, even though the arts are not valuable, um, and we might think of uh, space exploration in that way. So, 
it, it turns out that that when they did send people to the moon, there were actually all sorts of unforeseen benefits along the way. So, for example, um, with the Hubble telescope, uh, they didn't know this at the time, but it turns out that the algorithms that are used for the Hubble telescope are also used to de detect breast cancer in mammograms. Um, but that wasn't, that wasn't the goal of the Hubble telescope. And it turns out that all sorts of technology that was used in, in the space race um, to get to the moon had later benefits. But that's just going to help your case, right? So you're going to say, well, if that's really the case, then, well, yeah, go to the moon. Um, so, and then Mark wouldn't have the objection. But let's assume for a moment that there aren't these unforeseen consequences and it's not, it's, not, it's not beneficial. It still seems like funding something like a trip to the moon, even though it's not worth it in terms of tangible benefits, may be worth it in terms of intangible benefits. And so it seems like the problem with a purely capitalist view with no sort of over, no, no governing body that's pushing some other values of importance uh, might miss out on those values. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, um, you know, like the space program could produce these beneficial technologies, but like art probably will not. Like, I don't think people argue, oh, you know, by, by subsidizing the fine arts, we've gotten some great technologies. So, you know, with, the, with things like the space program, if it's really true that you can rationally expect to get um, new technologies, so you don't know what they're going to be, but if it's actually rational to expect that there will be super valuable new, new technologies that will be more valuable than the investment in the space program, then private companies should be willing to fund it. Right? And if they're not, then it's probably not probably not worth it. Okay. And then if you say, oh no, the private companies are just short-sighted and they don't realize that there are these technological benefits, but I like a, a theorist or a philosopher can see that there are going to be these benefits. I think you're probably wrong because if you had better judgment than the entrepreneurs, you'd probably be the one who was rich. <laughs> but anyway, okay. But, you know, going on to the point about subsidizing the arts, um, you know, should people who don't like the fine arts be forced to pay for it? Because that's what it is, right? Um, there are people who like to go to art museums and like the museum can charge them money to go, all right? And then you say, oh, but like, they're not gonna pay enough. There's not enough of those people or they're not willing to pay enough to make it worth it for the art museum to exist. So we need the government to do we need the government to pay, right? But what that means is we need to force the people who don't want the art to pay for it. This is not fair, right? And you know, like there's a lot of people who get nothing out of it. Sorry, but that's true. A lot of people who see the great art and they're like, whatever. They don't even, in fact, it's like negative value, right? You like make them go to the museum. They're like, oh God, I would pay to get out of here. <laughs> and then, um, Okay, yeah, so, I mean, point, point taken, point taken, but, but we could push this case, right? So it's not the arts, let's say, for example, but something closer to Mark's case of the COVID vaccine. Suppose it's not a COVID vaccine. Suppose it's a, a treatment for a rare disease, okay? So it's a certain type of cancer. It takes an enormous amount of R&D, a lot of money to develop that, that cure, and um, it just isn't profitable for any companies to do it. Um, yeah. on, a, on a state system, you could, you could have funding for those kind of diseases. Um, with a stateless system, you couldn't. You can get the government to fund some things that are good but not profitable, maybe. Depends upon what your value system is, right? But like that thing about the arts, you might think, well, maybe it's just like intrinsically valuable. Maybe the value of the art is not just the amount of pleasure that the viewers are getting out of it, but there's like this intangible benefit that you can't measure or whatever. And like you can get the government to pay for it and you can't get private um, in industry to pay for it or whatever because it's not profitable. But you should remember the other side of this argument, which is you can also get the government to pay for bad things that are not profitable. Right. And like, it's not so obvious that the government is going to have the correct values so that they'll like, they'll be doing the good things, but not the bad things. Right. Um, now about your example of um, there's a disease that's rare. And so you can't get private industry to do research into it. Um, well, so the private industry is focusing its resources on more common diseases. 
the government might decide to focus its resources on rare diseases. Well, I mean, I don't know, maybe they would just focus their effort on things that are kind of like appearing in the media or that like stimulate people's emotions or something like that, or like have some, some connection with somebody's political ideology. Okay, well, that's probably not the best way to distribute resources. Actually, the thing the private companies are doing is rational. Like if yeah, just from the utilitarian standpoint, as well as from this like profit-making standpoint, it's better to cure a disease that more people have. And I mean, we don't have infinite resources or we can't cure them all, right? So we do have to have these priorities. So, I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? So just a quick push on that. I mean, it might not just be rare diseases. It might be diseases that are endemic in parts of the world where people are very poor. So for example, you might, the classic case is something like uh, rich people will, will fund uh, baldness drugs, but they don't really care about malaria drugs because they're very unlikely to get malaria. Um, but malaria is going to be one of the biggest killers in the world. Um, so the private pharmaceutical companies don't have the interest to you know, come up with a good cure or distribute those drugs to those places where people are dying. And if you're doing a utilitarian calc, you've got hundreds of thousands of people dying in pretty miserable conditions, but they can't participate in the market economy. So, so much the worse for them would be the answer. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and what, what happens in the governmental system? Uh, same thing, right? Because the government of the rich country doesn't give a shit about the other countries because they're, you know, their voters are in their own country, like, and the people in the poor country are not getting to vote for the politicians. So. Mm -hmm. The malaria um, case is what's happening, right? Right now with states. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, um, U.S. government doesn't care about helping other countries. Uh, and so like, you know, they they spend a lot of resources on helping or allegedly helping people in America. But OK, so, you know, like what could be a solution to this? I mean, there the wealthy people would have to have sympathy for the poor people and like donate. And you might think, oh, well, they're not going to donate enough. Yeah. But I mean, they're not going to vote for the government to give them to give their money, like if they're not going to voluntarily donate, they're not also also not going to vote for the government to take their money and give it to the poor. So, so I mean, there are global aid agencies, and the question, I suppose, is if you say, well, they're not doing enough to make a big difference, your view could be, well, you know, you could forcibly extract resources from private citizens from around the world to give to the poor. And I think you're hell of a right to point out these things are not the government paying; it's private citizens, uh, often against their will. You are taking their stuff to give it to someone else. Um, you know, I, I do think that there's something to Nozick's line about taxation being theft and slavery. Um, and the question is to say, well, okay, we just, we just abandon all of that, all the international aid agencies and then our governments, there's none of that, you know, everyone fends for themselves. Or you take the view, well, if it's not sufficient, um, could it be done by more private actors? Do you want more Gates foundations that are, that are driving this, more philanthropic capitalists who say, well, I care about the suffering of others and we can coordinate together to help those people and we don't need the middleman state interfering. Yeah, here's the main thing that we should be thinking actually. Um, why are those countries poor? Like, let's fix that, right? Like the main thing we, shouldn't, we should be thinking is not, let's take money from the rich and give it to the poor, right? Main thing we should be thinking is how can we get those poor people to do what we're doing, right? We may not be able to, like it's easier said than done, right? But I mean, basically those countries need to become um, um, more free market capitalists, right? And like, it's gonna take some time. They're going to like over a period of decades have to develop and then eventually become wealthier. And that's how this whole thing is eventually gonna end, right? The, I mean, this stuff with um, people dying from malnutrition and not having medical care. The realistically, the only way that's going to stop is that the poor countries become wealthier countries, right? Um, but, you know, like, it's just like, if the economy as a whole grows, just everything gets better. It gets easier to do everything, right? Like, it gets easier to care for um, unemployed people or homeless people or whatever. Like, they have a better life. Like, homeless people in America have a better life than homeless people in a poor country. Just because, like, everything is better because the whole country is richer. Right. And, you know, and I mean, the relevance of this is my claim is if you have a more pure capitalist economy, then everything just everyone just gets richer, like the economy as a whole grows. And that makes it easier to do a lot of things. So let me ask you this. If we think about different positions on a political quadrant, so let's not talk about left and right. You know, I think that's often obfuscatory language. So let's say on the top left, we have 
authoritarian communism. So we can sort of imagine the Stalin style way of doing things. Let's say top right, we've got authoritarian capitalism. So maybe sort of like a Pinochet situation. And we've got bottom right, your position. So that's the, there's no state, it's anarchic, but it's capitalist. And then we've got um, bottom left, anarchic communism. Now, if I said to you, I know your ideal is to be bottom right. In other words, you want freedom from the state and you want free markets, but you've got to now pick a second one that you would like in order of preference. <laughs> Which one do you go for? I'm assuming it's not going to be the authoritarian communism that's going to be a complete polar opposite to you, but it does Wait, force I a choice. <laughs> no, I want to force you into a block. So the one is basically, do you choose the freedom from the state uh, or do you choose the free market? Oh, yeah. So like the uh, right-wing authoritarian or left-wing anarchism? <laughs> is, that, is that the question? Yeah, left-wing anarchism. Why? Because it's going to turn into right-wing anarchism. <laughs> 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 that is, um, like the left-wing anarchists, um, you know, like in, in a sense, their heart is in the right place. They're just confused about the way um, the world works. And if they set up their society, if they're really committed to the anarchism, it's going to go fine because what's going to happen is um, they're just going to evolve into capitalism. <laughs> right? and, and, you know, why am I saying this? Like, okay, so, so they, want, they want to get rid of private ownership of capital. That's what they want. Imagine that you could wave a magic wand and that happens. Like suddenly every business, the government goes away because that's part of the, what they want also, right? So the government goes away and every business magically becomes a worker cooperative where the workers collectively own it. And now there's, and there's no central authority to stop people from doing what they want. Yeah, now what's going to happen is some of the workers are going to say, hmm, I own a share of this business. I want to sell my share. And why would they say that? Because then they'll get some money right away. And like without risk, right? Like if the company goes under, then they lose their share. So if you're risk averse, you say, I want to sell my share and get money right now and not have that money at risk in case the business fails. And a bunch of people do that. And then some people buy those shares because some people are like, well, I want to take a risk because I think maybe the company will expand. Okay. And then you recreate capitalism, right? It's like that's what it is, right? You have people who are doing the work who don't want to take risks. So they don't have ownership stakes. And then you have the people who take risks and they have the ownership stakes. That's capitalism. And that's what's going to happen. That might not be, you know, answering exactly the way that you wanted, right? Well, I mean, we have some real world case of this. So there was, uh, uh, I think it was Chaz, which became Chop one way or the other in Portland. And they cordoned off a section of the city and proclaimed it a free republic. Um, these were not capitalists. These were, you know, uh, anarcho comms, right? And this sort of little utopia, this summer of love, didn't last very long, partly because some of the people in the society didn't believe in private property rights. And when their um, iPhones got taken, they complained and they said, but, but it's mine. And, uh, you know, the sort of uh, guys walking around with the AK-47s said, no, 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 it's, it's ours. This is all ours. Um, and very quickly, the sort of thing um, unraveled. Uh, you know, I think a couple of people died and eventually it, it sort of collapsed without the state intervening. I mean, this is the interesting thing about it. It was sort of a little social experiment was kind of allowed to flourish in some ways and it didn't flourish. So it seems that it could go two ways. The one is what happens is, as you say, the hope is they, they got the right bit on the freedom from the state and then they realized private property is quite a nice thing and they move towards, you know, your side of the grid. The other one is that the the communism ends up um, destroying the system and the anarchism disappears as well. Yeah, I mean, what you'd be worried about is like the, the anarcho-socialists, when they realize that they can't have both, they might decide, yeah, we like the socialism better than the anarchism part, right? And then they become, you know, like state socialists, right? Um, that's what I would worry about, but, you know, like the guys with the AK-47s going around, right? So this is, this is my concern as well is, I have two questions. So the one is, in our current situation, how do we transition to this kind of society? And the second one is, once you're in your proposed kind of society, how do you stop it from transitioning to a state society? Yeah, good. Yeah. So, I mean, the transition to anarchy makes a big difference to how the whole thing works out, right? And like, this is worth emphasizing. And also kind of like it, it matters what society you're in in the first place, if the government in the United States just disappeared, just, you know, like that, 
like they all quit their job and they're like, okay, no more government. Um, what would happen next? What would happen next is people would immediately start setting about, you know, setting up another government because almost everyone believes that you need a government. So they would probably create one and then probably wouldn't be a very good one either because most of them are not very good. So it would probably be worse. Or, you know, maybe it would just be like total chaos. Like the criminals start going, hey, you know, there's no cops anymore, right? Because like anarcho-capitalists, the security agencies aren't going to immediately appear, right? So the cops disappear and then suddenly the criminals run rampant just like rob and loot and whatever. Um, like that's what would happen. I say this by way of pointing out, it matters what the transition is, right? And the way I imagine the transition is that, um, first of all, you have to convince more, more people that uh, capitalism is good and like we should privatize more things. And then the government can gradually start privatizing things. Like they could privatize the police force, as I suggested at the beginning, um, like just, you know, have private security guards patrolling different areas. And by the way, like you need small areas and you need the people in the small area to get to decide among competing security agencies. I say that because those are like important points and you could have a privatization scheme that totally fails because they don't take that into account. Like the government grants a monopoly to a private security agency. Well, then that just reproduces the original problem, right? But anyway, okay. So you have competing security agencies. They just like gradually start outsourcing. And then, you know, eventually the government might realize, oh, we don't even need our own police force. Anymore. So then that goes away. And then uh, the government courts could start doing something similar. Like government courts could start saying, there are certain kinds of cases that we don't feel like we want to hear anymore. We're going to refer you to private arbitration. And then like, you know, you try to file a case in the court and like the court goes, well, here's a list of arbitrators. You know, you guys, you can alternately cross names off the list, you know, like you cross off your least favorite arbitrator, other side crosses off their least favorite arbitrator until you select one and then go have them resolve your dispute. They could do that. There are some cases in which they actually do that, like um, some automobile insurance disputes, they will refer, refer you to arbitration. They could just do that for more and more cases. Right. And then and um, I don't see why you can't have, um, you know, private private courts for criminal cases also. There could be a, you know, a private agency that also resolves the dispute between the defendant and a prosecutor. And why would anybody want to do this? Like, the, well, the court's motivation might be they're overcrowded, right? They have like huge backlogs. So they would like to get rid of some of their caseload. What would be the motivations for the people who are going to court? Um, they would like it too, because they want their case resolved more quickly. They don't want to wait in line for six months or whatever. And also private arbitrators are cheaper right? and they're probably more reliable, right? Or at least as reliable as a government court. So it could be a win-win, right? And then like, maybe this could expand until eventually we realize that, oh, like we don't need the government courts anymore. You would, you would hope to have like a more libertarian society so that we start to realize that we don't need laws for victimless crimes anymore. Like we probably have to like change people's minds in order to make those go away, right? Um, but you know, if, you're, if you get to a situation where all of the laws are about things that actually have victims, then it can all be handled by you know, disputing parties going to arbitration, right? Um, and you can't do that for the victimless crimes because like, you know, it won't enforce the drug laws because nobody's going to sue you for using drugs, right? Or at least not very many people would want to do that. All right, so, okay, so and then eventually you realize, oh yeah, actually this whole court thing, like all we need is the common law, you know, law that's made by judges in, in court cases. We don't need a separate legislature. Like, you know, if you got to this point where you've got the private court system and the private police, um, you don't actually need a legislature anymore. And then, okay, you get to um, anarcho-capitalism, right? Gradually, right? But like a key thing is you have to have the institutions that are replacing the government functions coming in as the government is shrinking. Like they have to be expanding while the government is shrinking. It can't be let you just destroy the government and then boom, you know, wait and see what happens, right? Um, okay, anyway, that was answering the first half of your question, I think. Yes. Um, and, and the second half of the question is you get there, right? So all of this happens. Um, what is to stop it from unraveling back? Um, so someone, one of these security companies uh, becomes particularly wealthy and decides that it wants power, not just money. 
Um, perhaps the head of the company decides he wants power, not just money. And suddenly you're back in a small state, which then grows and grows and you've got a state again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, you know, the idea is there would be a large number of security agencies, right? So, I mean, if you, if you think that um, industries under capitalism naturally develop monopolies, then you would think that that would happen. Like then we're gonna wind up with a government because somebody will monopolize the security agent industry. Um, but you know, that's, that's not in fact true, right? Most industries do not have natural monopolies. Um, and so, and in the security industry, there would probably be a large number of agencies because um, there are not large fixed costs. So the most efficient size is probably fairly small. And so like, you know, you try, like you have the security agency and you try to expand it more and more, but like as your as your organization grows, it gets less efficient, so it gets harder to compete with all of these other providers, right? If you think like if you start out with you know thousands of security agencies around the country, uh, it would be extremely difficult for one to take over, right? You know, like once you have the government system, it's stable. Like if you have a monopoly, you can just use your power to stop any competitors from starting up. But if you start in the competitive system where there's like a thousand other competitors, it's like, well, that's also stable, right? You don't really have a, an easy way of setting up a government. One of, my, one of my worries is given the way that humanity has sort of developed over time, why have we moved towards big central states um, as opposed to uh, allowing you know, this variety to flourish? So. Mm -hmm. Why aren't there any real world cases of anarcho-capitalists anarcho operating? Um, if the system is one that seems to respect individual freedom, uh, generate you know, good amounts of utility because you know, you've got this capitalism in place, what have been the impediments? Why, why has this not arisen in some part of the world? Yeah, I mean, I think the fate of society is path dependent. If you started out with the anarcho-capitalist system, it's hard to get rid of it. But if you start out with the state system, it's hard to get rid of that too. Like they're both sort of stable. Um, and, you know, sort of like we started with the state system. And I mean, I think the way that it started was basically um, a tribe of people would attack a neighboring tribe and subjugate them. And then, you know, the attackers say, you know, like we're now your rulers and then whatever, and then attack more tribes and so on. And, and then eventually they build up a state. Like, I think that's where it came from. The situation, so another thing is like the situation today would be different from um, the beginning of humanity, like the beginning of civilization. Uh, so one of the reasons is uh, like, we have different ideas now than we had before. So um, people have different moral values. And also there's like more understanding of how the anarcho-capitalist system would work. The ideas that the anarcho-capitalists are appealing to would be like totally bizarre to people 5,000 years ago. They wouldn't have, they wouldn't have really um, gotten this idea about individual rights and like, you know, the individual sovereign and all this stuff, right? And, you know, and how like you can't, you, you can't initiate the use of force against other people and stuff like that. Like people didn't really believe that <laughs> like it's very common for people to think yeah it's totally cool to initiate force you're not supposed to initiate force against your own people in your own tribe but you would totally do it to other tribes right anyway so like partly there's been moral development partly there's like more understanding of just like how the system is supposed to work um like understanding that comes from economists oh and also we're more advanced now and why does that make a difference? Well, basically today, anybody can kill anybody. And like that, that sounds bad, but that could be good, right? Because it used to be that some people could easily kill other people and those other people could not kill the former people, right? It was like, it used to be that if you were um, strong and large, you could kill the small and weak people. And today, the small and weak people can still kill the, the large, strong people. And why is that? Because of technology. Because like, you know, even like the, the smallest, weakest person can pull the trigger on a gun and that's all you need to kill someone, right? So anyway, how is that good? <laughs> how is that good? Well, because if there's like one group of people who can like just 
abuse other people with impunity, like, okay, that's where you get the, the lots of abuse. Like if you have one group of people who can do violence to the others and the others cannot do violence in return, that's, that's nearly as effective, then the group who have the power just, you know, exploit and dominate the others. But if like everyone has almost equal power, then, you know, you can't really mess with other people. It's like, you don't want to attack people because they could kill you, <laughs> like whatever. So like everybody should, everybody should be peaceful if they're about equally powerful, right? Nobody wants to start a fight because like, you don't know who's gonna win. Well, Michael, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it has been a pleasure having you on the show. Um, I, it's been a relief not to be the only anarchist in the room. Um, and uh, you did say that a very important part of this transition would be to convince people. So uh, I hope those who are listening uh, have at least started to question their, uh, their assumptions around the state. And one day I'm hoping to bring Mark over to the dark side. Um, so thank you very much for enabling that. Yes, excellent. I'm hoping to bring Mark over as well, perhaps today. <laughs> Ha, <laughs>